just like that, it's all over. Welcome to Collider Videos for your consideration. The greatest, the best award season series you will find anywhere in the universe. And that brings us to a close for award season 2021. The Academy Awards are in the rear view mirror. And I would say not a moment too soon. Now, before we get to the show, first things first, I have in my possession here a crisp $20 bill with Jeff Snyder's name on it. Like literally, like look at it. Look at it. It literally has Jeff Snyder's name on it because if everyone's been watching, and I know you've been watching this, this very challenging award season, FYC series this season, Jeff and I made another bet. So Jeff won the first year. I won last year. And now we are back to Jeff Snyder who correctly predicted that Frances McDormand would win Best Actress over Viola Davis. Now, granted, he also had Carrie Mulligan in the mix, but regardless, uh, well, it went to Frances McDormand. So, Jeff, this is your incentive to come back to California to get this $20 bill with your name on it. I might have to frame that because I don't think they're going to let me spend that anywhere. Now, you know what? You know where they'll let you spend this, Jeff? The arc light. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, first things first. Uh, Perry, what did you think of the 93rd Annual Academy Awards? What a big question to start with. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a long answer. I thought it was great at the very beginning. I was loving it. It was exactly what I had said that I wanted to see, which was basically a broadcast that through the need to get ratings out the window. There were no silly bits or, or anything taking away from the nominees and the winners. People were able to get up there and give a speech as long as they wanted without getting played off. The, the folks presenting the nominees were, were giving impassioned speeches about each individual nominee. I thought the whole thing was beautiful until it wasn't. And what wasn't it? it? <laughs> we we got to the in memoriam and I'm sitting there. I'm like, why, why does this feel like this is being played on fast forward? I don't like this. This doesn't feel right. But I tried to keep an open mind for the rest of the ceremony. Then right after that is when we got the category switch up. And while I think I know what the producers were going for, it's not how things panned out. And how things panned out were flat out disrespectful to Chloe Zhao and Nomadland in particular, a movie and a team of filmmakers who didn't get the big finish spotlight they deserved, but also a broadcast that started in a place that made me feel all warm and fuzzy for love and cinema and then left me feeling completely deflated by the whole thing. I, I wound up at the beginning absolutely loving it, thinking that I was going to want more of this for years to come. In the end, I, I want to forget it. I want to forget it and move on. Oh, wow. Jeff, what did you think of the 93rd Annual Academy Awards? I was into it to start, too. I, I love the intro with Regina King. I liked the, the bio stuff that we got about the screenwriters and, and, and doing those uh, two awards early on. But Perry, Perry, you know, hit the nail on the head. Like the memoriam is where things started to go off the rails. I hated the trivia game that they were playing with, with Glenn Close, like that late in the game. Like maybe that's something, for, you know, earlier in the evening to keep people interested. But at that point in the night, like, let's just get to the big awards. Um, I, 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 I thought it was weird uh, p putting Best Picture in front of Best Actor and Best Actress. You want to, you know, end the night with a group celebration on stage uh, as opposed to an individual in this case it was an individual who wasn't even there who beat someone who isn't even alive to accept it so I, well, I understand like Perry said what they were going for and, and maybe wanting to the night to lead up to the celebration of, of this uh, you know black actor who who, who was robbed who, who, whose life was was tragically cut short um, it, it, it did completely backfire as Collider's Adam Shitwood wrote this morning and, uh, it, and it left you, you know, you want to leave them on a high note and instead it left uh, you, you know, uh, on a sour note. Okay, well, so I agree with both of your points. I agree with both of you that, that it started off like, like I was really into it and I felt like, 
here we are, the last big award show of the season. We're at the finish line. We are at the gold standard of award shows, the Academy Awards, the, the award show that really matters above every other award show. For one thing, I was grateful that we were getting an in-person presence that looked like they took the necessary precautions to keep distances. And for the most part, we didn't see people wearing masks. I mean, obviously we saw Francis McDormand wearing a mask, uh, but we saw other people go sort of in the background. But I liked that it was an intimate affair. Uh, I did miss the, 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 the big production that we see at the Dolby Theater. I did miss, you know, those clip packages that we see. You know, some, some people kind of put them down as like, oh, they're just, a, it's just another clip package. But I get, I get excited by those clip packages. I like being reminded why I love movies, although I don't really need a reminder, but I love seeing those, those inspiring clip packages. I also, for once, I felt like, uh, you know, they could have kept the acceptance speeches to a time limit. Some of them went on a little too long. And I kind of miss the, I know that they had the big musical presentations during the pre-show, but I, I think they, they could have had them during the actual show. I don't know why they didn't. And then I agree with you. I was watching the uh, In Memoriam segment and it was like, why are they going so fast? Like slow the hell down. Now, what you guys brought up about the last award of the night. I think Perry, we know what the producers were going for. They wanted to finish the Oscars on a big emotional moment with an acceptance speech from Chadwick Boseman's widow after he won what would have been his Oscar for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Not only did that not happen, but Anthony Hopkins, who did win, and I have to say he did deserve to win, we'll get to that in a second, but he wasn't there. And just like that, just like that, it was over. So it left me, Perry, I was like you. I felt like empty. I felt like a little gutted. I felt like what the actual freak just happened here. And it reminded me of the Academy Awards that happened just a few years ago with the envelope, with the La La Land Moonlight Snafu, which, you know, that happened and then it was over. And we were all like, what the heck was that? So, so you know, but at the end, but in the end, ultimately, yeah, it was not a perfect show. But I think that after a global pandemic that seriously affected our business, this movie business, like the Arc Light Theaters, which we love, which hosted our screening series last year, is not even reopening yet. And the fact that the Academy Awards happened at all, on one hand, I feel like we should be grateful as movie fans, as Collider FYC fans, that they happened at all, that they happened in the way that they happened. Yeah, it was a missed opportunity in a lot of ways. And the big plan blowout at the end didn't work out the way it should have. And yes, they should have absolutely ended with everyone up there for best picture for Nomad Land, especially because you had uh, Chloe Zhao was also a producer and so was Frances McDormand. So it was a big night for women. Women won 17 Academy Awards last night. But uh, let's get to that best actor win. Uh, Jeff. What was your impression watching it? Uh, and what was your impression of the win? I mean, I, I was certainly surprised. I'd definitely been paying attention to the trades, people like Clayton Davis, who had sort of warned that, that this was in the air, that there was a, a surge of support from Anthony Hopkins late. I, I think what this ultimately showed is like, you know, it's tough to win one of these acting prizes when your movie is not nominated for Best Picture. And Ma Rainey's Black Bottom just didn't have the support that that we thought that it did this year. Um, the father performed very well, I think, when it won Best Adapted Screenplay earlier in the night. It was maybe a sign of, of things to come or, or, or of this upset brewing. Um, I, I, I think that Anthony Hopkins, Riz Ahmed, Chadwick Boseman, they were all deserving. So in the end, two people were going to be robbed unfortunately and, and Hopkins was deserving he was excellent in the father I just uh, I'm surprised that they went in his direction if they weren't going to go to Chadwick I really thought Riz could have pulled off the upset yeah that would have been an interesting upset and I have to say that never again will I will I not give more credit to the BAFTA awards which correctly predicted best actor and best actress for the Oscars I think BAFTA got all eight of the major awards wow amazing yeah that's amazing especially because 
some of the people who were nominated for especially acting Oscars were not nominated for acting Bathys. So there were some snubs there, some omissions, but in the end, they had all those matches, which I think is really, really interesting and worthy of, of a whole other conversation. Perry, what's your take on the last award of the night? Just to backtrack a little, because I want to add one more thing about Best Picture not being the last award. Mm -hmm. Another thing about that that didn't quite sit right with me is that's the only award that essentially respects the fact that making a movie isn't a one person job. We know the famous faces and the famous names and, you know, we put them on a pedestal, no doubt. But best picture is something that represents the fact that everybody from number one on the call sheet to every single PA on a production matters in order to come together and make that best picture. And I know we don't see every single person involved on stage when they do win best picture, but you see a lot of people up there. And to make this ceremony about the individuals, the stars, so to speak, in the end, didn't sit right. Again, I know what the producers were going for, and it could have been a beautiful ending for all I know. I'll agree with what Jeff just said. I I think a lot of the nominees in this category were very deserving. If I had a vote in the Academy, I would have given it to Chadwick Boseman. So yes, I am disappointed that he didn't win, but I don't want to take away from Anthony Hopkins win because his performance was beyond excellent. That is an incredible piece of work he delivered in that movie. And also, I don't want any of this to come across as I'm blaming Anthony Hopkins for not being there in person to give an impassioned speech when he won, because it is understandable why he wasn't there. And I think that the category switch was also disrespectful, not only to Anthony Hopkins, but to Francis McDormand. It put them in a position of pressure that they didn't need to have. And I also yeah. think that that choice is taking away from their wins a little rather than us sitting here celebrating them in full. And the whole thing is just not fair to everyone involved. And I don't like it. It, it was Soderbergh and the producers overthinking it a little bit. Uh, you know, well, I, I think uh, I think a lot of us were overthinking that that category, best actor. You know, after Chadwick Boseman was winning one award after another, I've, we all just got caught up in the in the momentum of it that he was the one to beat for for the Academy Awards. But I've been saying all along on Collider FYC that if I was an Academy member. I would have voted for Anthony Hopkins. I felt like he absolutely deserved it. I've been saying that since January of 2020, that this was his King Lear. It was a performance of a lifetime. And uh, he, at 83 years old, he is the oldest actor to win a competitive Oscar. And uh, listen, it, it just was a shock to him as well. I mean, he said in an, in an Instagram video that was posted the morning after the Oscars that he was asleep. He woke up the next morning to find out that he won. He didn't expect to win. And he actually gave a really nice tribute to Chadwick Boseman in his acceptance speech. But, uh, but again, look, the intentions of the Oscar producers were definitely there. It did not work out that way. And on one hand, of course, I completely agree with what both of you are saying, especially Perry, about how it took the, the spotlight away from all the victors of Nomadland. But on the other hand, it did make for an unforgettable moment that just like with a few years ago with the envelope, we are going to be going to be talking about in movies and in the Academy Awards for a long time to come. Nance, I am so incredibly sick of giving this ceremony a pass because we're talking about it because of a blunder. That's that's not OK. This isn't a situation where bad press is good press. We keep talking about this ceremony like it is the pinnacle of the year of film, which it is. If we want to say this is the this is the award show that matters the most the producers of the show and the way that the ceremony itself is handled needs to respect that. I'm not saying, and you guys know this when we talked about this a couple of years ago, I'm not someone who believed that 
the envelopes were purposefully mixed up so we'd have something to talk about after. I don't oh, think there's any scheming going on. And I don't think in this case, it was a smart move on the producers to put all of their eggs in one basket, assuming that that ending was going to happen. I think that was irresponsible on their part. But in general, I do not like this conversation or this standpoint, rather, that it's a it is a good thing to a degree, at least, that we're going to be talking about this for years to come because of the sour ending. OK, well, well, to be clear, I'm not giving the Oscars a pass because that happened. But the result of it is a moment that people are going to talk about. And to clarify, they're going to talk about it for the wrong reasons, because it was a, an ill-advised move that did not work out, and it disrespected the, the winner for Best Picture. So, Perry, I'm not saying that it was the greatest moment, uh, and when I refer to the envelope situation as a great moment, that was because of the way that everyone on stage handled the situation. You know, going back to that year when the producer, Jordan Harwitz, went back to the microphone and said, hey, there's a mistake. Moonlight, you win. And then all the producers of Moonlight and all the producers of La La Land were on stage together, hugging each other. That is a moment that where they made lemonade out of lemons. You know, they, they turned the bad situation into a really great one. That did not happen last night. And I am not giving the Oscars a pass because it's a completely different uh, end result. I mean, Hopkins wasn't there to give an acceptance speech. As soon as Joaquin Phoenix got done announcing that Hopkins won and that the Oscar would, would be collected on his behalf, just like that, it was over. There was no reaction to like, that was it. Man, ahead, I, I have a question for you, but I'm also going to explode if I, I don't say this. While I understand the the idea that it was nice to see the, the producers of both movies on stage hugging each other, that was supposed to be Moonlight's moment. And they didn't but get it their wasn't. moment. But Perry, Perry, I agree with you. I agree with you. It was supposed to be Moonlight. Mistake. But it wasn't. But they took a mistake and they showed themselves to be all class acts across the board. And they made a mistake into a beautiful moment. I, I Oscars, agree with that. I, no, I very Oscars, much. Wait a minute. No, no, Perry. The Oscars last night did not have that moment. And, and Hopkins wasn't even there. And of course, I don't blame him. Nobody blames him for not being there because he's 83. He's high risk. It would have been a big risk even, and, you know, in Wales. And, and everyone's know, telling him he's going to lose. He would have he would have had to go to London where, from what I understand, you know, COVID is not going down. They're, they're still like in kind of lockdown. So it would have been a bigger risk for him to go to the London hub to watch the Oscars and collect his award. So I don't blame him for not being there. I'm not absolutely not saying, oh, you know, it was still just so great that that we're going to have this moment to talk about. I'm not saying that at all, Perry. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes when things go wrong and you talk about it, in the case of, of a couple of years ago, yes, I, I agree. Moonlight should have had its moment. It didn't, but in the end, it did because what happened transcended the Oscars. We don't need to, to relitigate the, the, the Moonlight La La Land Oscars. Let's talk about last night and how it was a miscalculation bringing the, the evening down to Joaquin Phoenix, okay? No matter what, because this is a low key guy. I don't see how, how the Oscars climax with him giving out that award. And, and what this show really needed was a host. It needed a host to bring that moment together to say something to the audience and, and give them that farewell. Be like, oh my God, you know, we were all expecting a, a different, uh, you know. Ending. After the shock of the envelope moment, uh, you know, when I thought about it for the rest of the night and into the next morning, you know, that's when I started to warm up to, well, they really took a bad situation and turned it into a beautiful moment. You know, I do not feel that way at all this year with the Oscars because there was no beautiful moment to be had because the winner wasn't even there. And the uh, the person who presented the award uh, looked like a deer in the headlights and that was it. It was over. So it's an unforgettable moment, but not one that I cherish, Perry. That's the, that's what I'm making clear. I'm not I'm not, you know, trying to yeah. make lemonades out of lemons. Uh, 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 with, with this with, with this award show, with that, I, I don't agree that they should have ended the Oscar with Best Actor. I don't agree with any of that. But 
you know, it, it certainly wasn't a boring ending. I, I think we got to give Soderbergh and, and his fellow producers credit for taking a big swing. It just, they struck out in the end. Well, yeah. I mean, they, you know, it was the mighty Casey. The mighty Casey struck out. Again, I, I don't think the Oscars is the point to take such a big swing that you could completely strike out and ruin the entire ceremony. And, you know, I don't want to take away from the folks that won and for the beautiful moments that we had before this happened, because there were a lot of great ones and a lot of elements of this show that I absolutely loved. And I don't want to take away from any of these wins either, but to end the season on such a sour note to take a big swing. Oh, I can't give you a, a, an okay on that decision. Right. Well, well, I know. Listen, it was definitely a shock. It was definitely like, wait, what the hell is going on? They're, they're doing Best Picture now. They still have two more awards to go. That was definitely like, okay. Well, I think that moment, you know, a lot of people woke up. Like, what are they doing? They're giving Best, best Picture out before they've even done Best Actor or Best Actress. But then I was like, oh, I know what they're doing. They're going to get Best Actor out last. It's going to go to Chadwick Boseman. It's and I, I don't agree with that, but it happened. It happened and it did not work out like anybody planned it did not work out like anybody predicted and you know perry i i feel your pain i feel your frustration i agree with your disappointment i just you know uh um i'm just you know we're talking about it and and that i think the big swing that we had last night was that the oscars happened at all and it did not look like all of the other zoom sessions that we had and for that I am giving the Academy a pass. I am giving the producers a pass. I was grateful to watch the Academy Awards. Yeah, it was boring. Yeah, it could have had some more pizzazz and some more flash with the clips packages and the, the musical numbers. We didn't have any of that, but we did have an in-person presence after our business was decimated and people have been struggling and you know more than 550,000 Americans have perished because of COVID and we still have the Academy Awards and it was a classy affair that was in tone with the moment with our times. So yeah, it was a fiasco at that last moment, but there, if the Oscars did have their merits and I'm, I'm, I'm going to embrace that side of it. Should we talk about the winners more? Yes, let's talk more about the winners, like Best Actress, which, Jeff, in case you've forgotten, look at that beautiful, handsome $20 bill with your name written all over it. Woo! And I did it in blue, so it would show up even better on the Zoom. Look at that. Jeff, good luck. I, I mean, I'm, 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 very, I'm very, you know, honored to, uh, to have beaten you at, at our Oscar bet. Although <laughs> I, I, I won a couple hundred bucks betting online. I, I, I saw some good odds on McDormand in the days late, leading up to this race. Uh, so, so, I mean, wh why do you think in the end she triumphed over Viola and, and Carrie and, and got her third award? Okay, well, I think for one thing, uh, you know, Best Actress was the award that everyone was looking at because it was the most competitive award to be given out that night. That you had four potential winners. I mean, actually, I mean, all of them were, were worthy, all of them deserved it. But it really was up there between Frances McDormand, Viola Davis, and, uh, and, and Andra Day, and Carrie Mulligan. And, you know, I, I think the momentum for the movie itself was so strong. And Frances McDormand was in every scene of the film and she produced the movie. She is now the most honored lead actress with three lead actress Oscars, second only to Katherine Hepburn who had four. And she now has more lead actress Oscars than Meryl Streep who also has three Oscars but one of them was for supporting actress. Perry, what's your take on best actress? I'm still in shock. I think it probably came down to it being a complete toss up in particular between Frances McDormand, Carrie Mulligan and Viola Davis. And I, I think it could have been anyone's guess by the time we hit the ceremony. I think Andrew Day was in the mix as well, but I was kind of wondering if the favorites at a point would split the vote enough that Vanessa Kirby could sneak in there. But you know, at that point of the night, I was basically sitting there waiting to hear one of three names called. And that, and that was it. And it was just, it was one of the three that I expected. And Nomadland was my number one movie of 2020. I think her work is absolutely incredible in it. And even though I might've given my vote to somebody else, I am thrilled that she won. Well, I, I agree. I mean, you know, she is one of the three favorites to win and she did win. And Jeff has a $20 bill with his name I, on it. So. I think it shows that, that the guild races, I'm, I, I'm telling you, there's just something different 
about filling out an Academy Awards ballot than there is a SAG ballot. It's just different. You don't in implicitly vote for the same person that you voted for for SAG. So I just have always felt, and this goes back to teenage Jeff, that the guilds, that the weight that the prognosticators put on the Guild Awards is a little bit too much. Well, um, in the cinematography category. Yeah, no, hey, you, you were right there. I just don't think it's a hard and fast rule. It's a probably not an absolute. The other thing, I think Carrie Mulligan, her campaign seemed like it peaked a little early. Uh, I think it was probably tough to keep the momentum up for, for that movie. Um, and I'm also glad that we, we didn't subscribe to the idea, well, Frances has won twice before. You know, she doesn't need a third one. That, I don't want to hear that. I just want to hear, you know, what are your thoughts on this work? Forget if she's won in the past. And I'm glad that they ignored that and gave it her third. And she could very well win her fourth this coming year as the, the female lead in the, the tragedy of Macbeth. So well, she quoted Macbeth during her acceptance speech. And and now, you know, best director went to Chloe Zhao, the first Asian to win a director, the second woman after Catherine Bigelow for the Hurt Locker to win, first woman of color to win best director. And the thing about Nomad Land is like it didn't just win all the other award shows that we've seen over the last couple months. It won the best picture at the Venice Film Festival. It won best picture at the Toronto Film Festival from September. And a lot of times when you have movies that peak early or that, that uh, are, are sort of the favorite to win from the very beginning, it's hard to maintain that momentum for a six month award season, let alone the eight month award season that we just had. And the fact that Nomadland won those top prizes back in September and all the way through eight months later to the end of the Academy Awards is incredible staying power for a film that had stayed right there at the top the whole time. And also we have to give credit here, especially for best picture, going back to best picture uh, to Fox Searchlight, or now they're known as Searchlight Pictures, because now with the win for Nomadland, that means that Searchlight Pictures has won five best pictures over a 13-year period. Slumdog Millionaire, 12 Years a Slave, Birdman, The Shape of Water, and now you have Nomadland. And the outgoing chairman, uh, you know Nancy Utley, who I've gotten to know very, very, very well over the last 22 years, uh, you know, and, and it was so easy to champion her films because they were always great. And she always kept Searchlight uh, ahead of the game by taking so many big chances. Uh, I think it is a, uh, a massive uh, bow. Talk about uh, going out on the highest note possible. So uh, Perry, best director, Colby Zhao, any thoughts there? I'm just absolutely thrilled. And I had my fingers crossed that immediately, you know, maybe this would have made me perk up last night. If immediately after the ceremony, Marvel released an Eternals trailer that said from Academy Award winning director, Chloe Zhao, that could have changed my mood in a flash. But, you know, this is another thing that I'm just absolutely thrilled about. She just crushed it throughout award season. I knew this was coming, but that didn't take away from any of the excitement when it actually happened. It was so well-deserved. And, you know, throughout her, throughout the ceremony, all of her speeches, even the interviews beforehand, it just, it, it made me root for her more and more, which I didn't even know was possible at this point. So I'm thrilled for her and can't wait to see more. Jeff, any other big surprises for, for the rest of the night? The Judas and, and the Black Messiah song win was a big surprise to mm -hmm. me, just because I, I really thought one, that's where One Night in Miami would walk away with an award. But I, I you know, if you looked at um, some of the articles before the Oscars, Judas and the Black Messiah had the most awareness among you know the the audience or whatever be, you know because it was readily available on, on hbo max so I, it's like i do think that that the eligibility extension to january and february really made a difference when you you have movies like minari uh you know the father judas and the black messiah all those were sort of officially released uh in, in february i want to say um but but the song thing uh it, it just I, I think that movie had a lot of support, Judas. I would have loved to have seen the best picture breakdown because I, I like I had Judas, I think, third overall in my best picture probabilities. Behind, I thought Minari could have pulled off a, a steal there. But um, yeah, I, congrats to her. It's a good song. 
Uh, Perry, just, any other thoughts on any uh, surprises or snubs? I mean, the, the one the, the one that I had my eye on was the cinematography category. Yeah, I was yeah. just, you know, more so than anything, curious to see how it panned out. It definitely boiled down to Nomadland and Mank for me. And again, I would have been happy to see either of them win. But that was definitely a case where I was just plain old curious to see if Mank got some support. Because what did, what did that one walk away with? Two? Two wins in the Mank end? Got the, Mank got cinematography and production design. Yeah. Weren't the awards this year fairly evenly spread, too? It was well, well, yeah. For most everybody. You sound. had uh, Sound of Metal won sound, which, uh, which seemed like a given, but it also yeah, won yeah. editing. Uh, I, you know, I was kind of leaning towards trial of the Chicago 7 for editing because I felt like you know, there's a, a sort of a popular favorite, a, you know, a crowd pleaser, so to speak, and it's got to win something and it's not going to win Best Picture. So maybe they'll give and it's not going to win screenplay, but maybe they'll give it to editing. And no, they went to Sound of Metal for both, which, by the way, I think is pretty common for for sound and editing categories to uh, to go uh, hand in hand. They certainly have done so for the past few years. But uh, Jeff, the question I have for you. Are you right? OK, so. I remember maybe it was last summer, maybe it was last summer when we did a special like, you know, summer uh, special FYC just to kind of, you know, just to see each other really, uh, first of all. But I think I might've made the comment that I felt like because everyone was watching the streaming services that if there was any year for Netflix to win best picture, that this would be the year, especially with the likes of Mank and Trial of the Chicago 7 and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And in the end, they did win, I think, seven Oscars and they were mostly in the crafts. Uh, they had costume design and hair and makeup, hairstyling for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, cinematography, production design for Mank. Uh, and uh, they did not get any of the Netflix major. is too beholden to politics, okay? To internal politics where, oh, we've got David Fincher and we've got Aaron Sorkin and these are the guys that we got to make happy and these are our, our two front runners. And no, these two movies never, ever had a chance at winning Best Picture. The same way Netflix had no idea that My Octopus Teacher was going to be its, its leading doc now. Like they were getting behind Cripkin, which I thought was fantastic and, and should have won. I actually haven't seen Octopus Teacher, but it's like, I think that Netflix has it, their internal gauge is way off and they need to do something about that and fix it ASAP. Otherwise they're never going to win the big one. Wow. Perry, what's your take on Netflix? I'm going to, I'm going to agree with Jeff and, and they had a big night. We can't take away from that. They definitely did mighty well in the shorts categories. Um, <laughs> But when it comes to best picture, and I would say when it comes to support in general, I think they put too much weight behind the wrong movies. And I don't want that to come across like I didn't like things like Trial of the Chicago 7, because even though that wasn't my favorite movie of the year by any means, I, I thought it was it was a very solid film. But, you know, you think about some other things it had, like Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and also I'll go back to The Five Bloods. Those are films that probably could have made even more noise if they had more resources behind them. Pre-COVID, I felt like there was there was sort of an aversion to giving Netflix Best Picture uh, because like a Best Picture Oscar should go to a movie that's on the big screen. Jeff, There's, you're no aversion. Your There's no aversion, okay? If they have a great movie, they'll win Best Picture. It's that simple. The Irishman and Roma are not great movies. All right, there you go. <laughs> let's move on from that conversation. <laughs> and let's, let's look at the supporting actor and supporting actress. I feel like these two categories were locks. Uh, Daniel Kuluya for Judas and the Black Messiah. I loved his speech. It was really funny. And Yeo Jung Yoon for Minari, the first Korean actor to win in an acting category, which I think is awesome. Perry, what's your take on those two categories? Um, these went exactly the way that I expected them to. And I'm, I'm thrilled for it. You guys know I'm a big Judas and the Black Messiah fan. So I was really rooting pretty hardcore for Daniel Kaluuya. And yeah, his, his speech delighted me. There's an instance where I'm glad that they let him go long because the ending was, was mighty amusing. 
I don't care. I thought it was very funny. And Yu Jun Yoon happened to be my favorite acceptance speech of the night. She was just like delightful and entertaining, but also making some very strong points throughout that I think needed to be said. And the, the one that really hit me in particular is when she made that comment about, you know, basically not being able to be in competition with four other actors who were playing completely different roles and in completely different films. And here we are weighing them like, you know, it's apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So I like the fact that someone actually said that out, out loud. I can't remember the last time someone did say that, but it's true, but she's deserving of this win and I'm glad the Oscar went to her. All right, Jeff, just take. I, I too was delighted, um, but I think that she's right. There's an element of luck to it where she said to Glenn Close, I'm just luckier than you because it's not just about the performance. It's about the, the screenplay that you're working off of. It's about the way that the movie's presented. Like I thought Glenn Close was really good in Hillbilly Elegy, but nobody liked that movie. So like she was always facing an uphill battle. Um, I, I was thrilled that, uh, that the Minari grandma won and, and I'm happy for Daniel Kaluuya, even though I was rooting for Paul Racy. Um, I, I know Daniel did a really good job in that and he's going to have a, a, a long, fruitful career in, in Hollywood. So I'm, I'm glad that he was honored because he's been excellent. Uh, so far. I, I just love hearing the words Academy Award winner Daniel Kaluuya because boy, did he deserve that. And uh, uh, let's look at uh, original screenplay as expected. Did go to Promising Young Woman. Adapted screen play a lot of people were predicting that no man land would win there as well and it went to the father which like you said jeff was an indication that there there might be more support for that movie in the end than a lot of people are giving you credit for uh why did the father win over over nomad i think a lot of it i play? think writers and in general the, the the industry really respect dialogue uh and, and the father was just a war of words um so i think it really went to that Okay, we also have an uh, international feature went to another round uh, where its director gave a very, very moving speech. Perry, I know you love, you, you jokingly predicted that he might win Best Director on the second to the last episode. But what do you think of, uh, of that win there and that speech that Vitterberg gave? I've, I've been rooting for that film ever since I saw it. And even though I knew the story behind the making of the film. It was crushing, but also heartening to see him get up there and say what he did. I thought I thought it was just like a, a beautiful, really moving use of his time at the podium. And it just made me even more excited for someone I was already rooting for. Uh, but about, uh, listen, animated feature, Soul, that was predicted winner. It also won for score. So Soul... Jeff, that was the the projected winner there, and I, you know, I know you loved Onward, but uh, you know, Pixar does it again. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I wasn't surprised, and a lot, a couple people were predicting a Wolf Walker's upset, but I just, I just never felt that was in the cards. It seemed like a, a soul head score, you know, in in the bag the whole time. And then as for another round. Um, yeah, I, I just didn't see like what what was the movie that was going to come out of nowhere to knock that off its perch, you know. So those three were were, were all fairly expected. For best song, I, I mean, I I think we were all most people were predicting that Speak Now from from One Night in Miami would take it, and instead it went to Fight for You from Judas and the Black Messiah. Perry, why do you think that uh, that prevailed? I know you're happy that it did. <laughs> um, I'll go back to what Jeff was saying. I think there was a, a pretty significant groundswell of support behind that film, and I also think uh, her has been in the spotlight quite a bit recently, and that might have added some momentum to that campaign. But, you know, song is one of those categories where Every single time I listen to one of them, I'm like, that should win. That should win. No, that should win. So yeah, we'll be yeah. here no matter what one I was going to be happy. I, wa I watched with my brother last night and he asked who, who that was. And I said, that's her. And he's like, her, her who? Like, it became like a who's on first routine. <laughs> What's on second? I don't know. Third base. Visual effects, as expected, went to Tenet. Animated short, If Anything Happens, I Love You. Live action short, Two Distant Strangers. Documentary short, uh, I don't think we predicted Colette, but oh. there it was. Nope. Jeff. 
Big, yeah, a big surprise. I mean, I, again, I haven't seen the shorts, so I can't say whether Colette was de deserving one way or the other, but uh, I definitely did not see too many people picking that one. That was like the third or fourth ranked, I, I felt like, in that category. They're all necessary stories. I mean, it goes back to what Yoo Jung Yoon said in her speech. You know, we're, we're here picking the best from a pool of excellent films where really every single one is deserving, but given given the content and what I thought the Academy response might be, I felt really confident in going with either a concerto as a conversation or a love song for Latasha. And last minute I put love song for Latasha at number one, mainly because of what I said on our last show, I've never seen a documentary narrative told quite like that. So I thought the subject matter and the way that they brought that to screen was going to get that one the win, but C Colette is fantastic as well. So good on that team for winning this. Well, so any parting words for award season 2021, Jeff? Parting words. Um, I mean, I think that, listen, this was a tough year all around. I wouldn't have hesitated to cancel the Oscars and just come back next year and with a, with a ceremony that awarded two years worth of movies and really like celebrated the return of, of movie theaters and everything. But I also understand the, the element of the, uh, the show must go on and, and that we can't just, you know, um, for, forget about an entire year's worth of movies because of this pandemic. So I think that they made the most of it. I think that the right movie in the end won. I, I was happy with a lot of the performances that won. And I'm ready to move on to, to this year's crop of movies, which I think should be a little bit better, hopefully. Harry? I'll agree with something you said earlier, Mance. I am very grateful that the Oscars aired last night because I needed it. I think I think I would have been in a in a pretty sad place had we had a year without the Academy Awards. It, it wouldn't feel right to me. And I'm still of the mind that they should have gone with the, the original schedule and had that fully represent a unique year. But in terms of what we got, there's a whole bunch of, of work and individual accomplishments here that I'm glad we had a night to celebrate. As far as the big blunder at the end, I'm very much ready to just move on. But remember what happened here and learn from it. Any blunder in any ceremony, that, that's the thing. You don't want to sit and dwell and harp on it, but you want to make sure it's spoken about in the right way so the folks involved in this very prestigious ceremony can learn and never make that mistake again. So I will hope that winds up being the case. And I was very excited to, I, I guess more so tomorrow, to wake up tomorrow morning and celebrate the start of a brand new season. Well, amen to all of that. And I have to say, you know, to your point that to consider that the Oscars might not have happened at all. You know, I'm thinking back to last last September when I did not get to go to Telluride. We did not get to go to Toronto. Thinking back to, to January that we did not get to go to Sundance and feeling the big, uh, the, the emptiness, feeling the loss, grieving the loss of the seminal movie events that I love and cherish each and every year for as long as I've been in this business. And to consider that we might not have had the Oscars would have been the most devastating thing of all. So yes, it wasn't perfect. Yes, it ended on a really strange note that like Perry said, uh, that hopefully they will learn from that mistake and some other mistakes as well. But uh, I am not only grateful that we had the Oscars, not only am I grateful and relieved that it's over and we can start fresh with a brand new Oscar season that is not that far away, but the thing I am most grateful of all is that we, the three of us, got to talk about movies during this award season. I thought that maybe season three of Collider FYC would not happen, but it did. I am grateful to you, Perry Nemiroff. I'm you grateful to you, Jeff Snyder. I'm grateful to Thad, Thad Williams, our, our unsung hero of Collider FYC. And I'm grateful to all of you for supporting us through a very challenging year, a very challenging Collider FYC. We now have three seasons of Collider FYC under the, uh, in the books. Jeff, you gotta say something there. I, I just want to set us up for a little tease for next year, okay? We okay. got our first look last night at Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. 
as well as a new In the Heights trailer. So could it be one of these big studio musicals? Or do we think that the little Sundance movie like Coda, which won all the awards at Sundance, is that the race that we're looking at next year? What do you guys think? Every movie that Jeff just named will be in the conversation. And I will also include a Sundance title, Mass. I'm going to say that uh, tease, tease season four of Collider FYC by saying, I'm going to take that here guitar right behind me. And Perry is going to take that saxophone right behind her. And we are going to come back in season four with a theme song for Collider FYC oh, yeah. that both Perry and I will play the music on and Jeff will sing the lyrics for. <laughs> when we do, when we do Collider FYC from our Collider FYC studio at Times Square in New York City. Okay, maybe that, none of that is gonna happen, but here's what we can promise. Collider FYC will return. So once again, thank you everyone. And until next season, FY, see you later. <laughs>